Good afternoon and welcome to this very special live event, Breast Cancer from Screening to Advancements in Care, courtesy of Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'm Kristen Keough. We have some of the top minds in the field joining us today, including Dr. Hung Kong, Dr. Uma Goyle, and Dr. Veeler Loving. They're all fantastic doctors with Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center, and we look forward to chatting with them in a moment. First, we want to go over some quick housekeeping items. This is a live streaming event, so if the stream goes down at any time or you have connection issues, we recommend just logging off and logging back on. This event will be available to stream and share on demand once the show is over. So we will be bringing up our doctors one at a time to go over some key items related to breast cancer and the patient journey, and then we will have a panel discussion with all of the doctors together. So that being said, we invite you watching at home or at your office to submit questions throughout the show using the chat feature and we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can. Now let's get started and meet our first doctor. My name is Uma Goyle and I practice radiation oncology. I specialize in gastrointestinal and sarcoma tumors. What is unique with my approach to my practice is that I really put the patient first and if I need to stay after hours, then I do. If I need to come in early, I do. Um, I really feel like the patient is the most important part of what we do. If someone was recommending me to a friend or family member, I would hope that they would say Dr. Goyle is a compassionate physician and that um, I felt comfortable with my care here. Dr. Goyle, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. We really are so grateful for all the insights that you're going to share with us. Thanks for having me. And we particularly want to speak with you about statistics. So let's start with this. How many women are diagnosed each year? So there's going to be approximately 297,000 cases of breast cancer diagnosed this year. And survival rates, what are survival rates looking like now? So there's an estimated 43,000 deaths from breast cancer expected in 2023. Um, overall, the five-year uh, survival rate for breast cancer is 91%, but stage is really important in determining that. Can you help us understand those stages more? Could you break down the stages and the corresponding survivability? Yes, yeah, so I have a graphic. Um, so stage zero is in situ disease. We treat it very similar to stage one. Stage one is where there is a tumor in the breast that's two centimeters or less, no lymph nodes. Stage two, where um, the tumor can be up to five centimeters in the breast and there may be some movable lymph nodes in the axilla. Stage three, where there could be any size tumor in the breast, but now we've got lymph nodes potentially in the axilla, the internal mammary lymph nodes along the breastbone, or the supraclavicular, infraclavicular region, which is above or below the collarbone. And stage four, where there's distant metastatic disease, meaning it has spread outside of the breast to other parts of the body. And there's another graphic that shows based on a patient's stage, what their potential five-year survival. So stage one, survival is 99%. Stage two or three, it's about 86%. And then stage four is 31%. Given everything that you just shared with us, how important is early detection? Yeah, so early detection is really important. The sooner we can diagnose a breast cancer at an early stage, the improved survival rates for the patients. Dr. Goyle, thank you so much. Uh, now it is time to meet our next doctor. Dr. Beeler Loving, radiology. In my practice, communication is extremely important. I highly encourage patients to openly ask questions and any concerns that they have about their health. And my job is to then address those questions and concerns as clearly and accurately as possible. I want to make sure that when patients leave from their meeting with me, that they clearly are, uh, understand and are comfortable with their diagnosis and subsequent treatment plans. 
The nicest thing that a patient can say about me is that I've made a scary situation into a comfortable one. Breast cancer can be a scary time for a lot of people. And we don't know what's going to happen next, we don't know what the plan is, and we're not comfortable with that. As a physician, my job is to share my knowledge and make people comfortable. Uh, so if they know what the diagnosis is clearly, and if they know what the treatment plan is more clearly, that leads to less anxiety and uh, less of a scary situation for people. And Dr. Velert Loving is here with us in studio. Thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this discussion. Thanks for having me today. And we're going to be talking about screening mammograms. Um, let's go over what are the current guidelines for mammogram? So it, it can be confusing um, because there are different guidelines and sometimes the suggestions by these guidelines conflict and um, there, are, there are different opinions and different organizations. Um, what is a commonality between all of them is that all of them agree that screening, particularly starting at age 40 and getting screening every year, has the most benefit in terms of decreasing risk of death from breast cancer. So that's, that's common between all of them. There, there is some variation though that some people may notice with some organizations that recommend getting mammograms once a year instead of every year. Um, and some recommend starting at age 50 rather than at age 40. The reason why that there is variation is, um, again, all of them agree that the most lives are saved starting at 40 once a year, but there is a trade-off in that the more you screen, there's also a risk of getting uh, a mammogram. And those risks, by far the most common risk that's, that's touted against mammograms getting it once a year is the possibility of having uh, what's called a false positive or, or what's called a false alarm. Um, and that's a downside in the sense that if you have a mammogram and it shows something as possibly being abnormal, um, you would have to have additional testing to clarify if that abnormality is significant or not. Um, and so, not surprisingly, the more you have screening mammograms, the more that you would potentially have these false alarms. Um, and so, that's why there's this variation in, in these guidelines, because some organizations weigh that downside more heavily um, than others. Let's talk about what your patients tell you about why they put off getting mammograms. What are some of the fears that women have about these tests? So uh, one of the fears, which I just touched on there, was about the false alarms. You know, if, if a woman has a mammogram and they get notified that the mammogram may be abnormal, that can cause a large amount of anxiety and mm -hmm. fear that something's happening. Um, it is important to know that the vast majority of those false alarms are clarified with some additional pictures. One or two additional pictures and it clarifies everything and then they're, they're done. Um, and so um, people should be reassured that uh, the vast majority of those additional workups don't, don't require much additional testing. One of the other fears that I hear a lot about with mammograms is about radiation. Um, X-rays are involved with mammograms and X-rays are a form of radiation. Um, so it's important to know that the amount of radiation with a mammogram is extremely low. Um, so to put things in perspective, uh, a mammogram or having a mammogram typically um, gives a dose that's equal to about seven weeks of what we call background radiation. So all of us, by living on the earth, we walk around, we're exposed to a very, very small amount, amount of radiation um, at all times. And that radiation comes from rocks, comes from the sun, comes from food that we eat. Um, and the dose of radiation that we get from those background sources is extremely small. And by living on the earth for seven weeks, all of us have had a mammogram. That's the amount of dose that we get from a mammogram. So it's, it's a very, very small amount. Um, and in terms of ill effects or health effects, um, the, the amount of radiation that we get from mammograms, the, the ill effect rate or fear for that radiation should be very, very small, almost negligible. Okay, great information. Um, for those of us who may have not had a mammogram yet, um, what should we expect? And can you explain at all actually how they work? Of course, yeah, so typically what happens during a screening mammogram is a patient will come in, um, people should wear uh, something that they're able to remove their top easily. Um, we do encourage people not to wear lotions or deodorant or creams because sometimes that, that can interfere with the mammogram pictures. Um, and during the course of the mammogram, a woman should expect to have their breasts compressed. Um, and uh, honestly, for a lot of patients, that portion of the exam can be uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to have your breasts com compressed yeah. or squeezed. Um, so I think it's helpful to understand why that, that compression is important um, and for a number of different reasons. First, um, when you compress the breast, you can think of the breast as kind of like a cone shape or the nipple is the tip of the cone. Um, when you compress the breast and make it flatter, 
um, it makes the breast shape more even. Um, and that makes the, the picture that's being taken uh, more of an even picture instead of different thicknesses of breast tissue. Uh, another reason we do the compression is because it lowers the radiation dose. Um, if you can make the breast thinner, the amount of, uh, of x-ray beam that needs to pass through it can be smaller, and so it decreases the radiation dose. Um, and the third reason why it's important that compression is it, it basically helps people to hold still. Um, it's like any photograph, even with your cell phone, you take a picture of someone's moving, the picture gets blurry. And so same thing with a mammogram picture, we want the, the person to hold as still as we can for that picture, and compression helps to hold that in place. Um, so um, that compression will occur, and we typically will take a total of two pictures for each breast, so four pictures total. Um, and the entire exam from start to finish is typically about five to ten minutes. Oh, that's all? Um, that's it, and then okay. free to go. Um, and, and usually the, the person will get the results. In some facilities, they'll get the results that same day from the radiologist. In some facilities, they'll get it uh, via the mail. Uh, can take up to a week, depending on the, how long it takes for the mail to get delivered to their household. Um, and that's it. That's for our mammogram. Very, very helpful. Thank you so much. And now we're going to meet our third and final doctor who will be joining us. I'm Dr. Hong Kong. I'm a breast medical oncologist at Banner Health. As a college student, I did um, research in cancer immunotherapy, activating the immune system to fight cancer. I found that fascinating that we can use the immune system to fight cancer, so I decided to go into oncology. I look at the patient in totality. Uh, I don't look at the disease uh, by itself. Uh, I look at the patient's age, performance status, physical condition, and their comorbidities uh, to formulate a final plan for their care. Some key factors that make a successful patient-doctor relationship are compassion, communication, and trust. What do I want a patient to uh, say about me to someone else is that I am a physician who would give them the best care possible, that I care, that I treat them with respect, and I would treat them as my own family members. All right, joining us now is Dr. Kong. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Chris. So we're gonna be talking about treatment for this portion. So what are the different types of treatment that are offered? So there are the four common treatment modalities that people are aware of. So we have surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and endocrine therapy, which is hormonal therapy. However, there's a, the, the fifth um, option that are more recent, more exciting, is called immunotherapy, meaning activating the, uh, the immune system to fight cancer. So that's, that's kind of new to breast cancer. It's a very exciting field. That is exciting. Yeah. Um, how does treatment vary depending on the stage? So yeah, it's, it's very important to know what you are treating for, right? Because for early stage, the treatment for curative. For late stage, as in stage four, we cannot cure the cancer, but it's treatable. So therefore, it's important to upfront you know the purpose of treatment for, for each patient. Uh, so for, for early stage, you know, surgery is recommended for most patients, uh, except for a very rare uh, cases where we don't recommend chemo, of, especially for patients who are very elderly who cannot tolerate you know, mm -hmm. chemo, um, mm -hmm. surgery. Uh, so surgery is recommended. Radiation, some patients do radiation. It depends on, on the stage of the disease. If they have lymph node positive or if they have like a lumpectomy and staph mastectomy, then we do radiation. So chemotherapy also dependent on the characteristic of each tumor type. Uh, so. Can you talk more about the developments in care, some of the newer information that's coming out that you're excited about? Yeah, so, so breast cancer, there's so many new treatments that, that uh, came out recently, recently within the last you know, few months to a few years, really. So for, for example, some of the treatments called CDK4-6 inhibitors, these are molecules that make the cancer less susceptible, uh, more susceptible to, to endocrine therapy and less um, resistant to endocrine therapy. So nowadays, it's a standard of care to give endocrine therapy together with the CDK4-6 inhibitors. And there are, of course, immunotherapy I talked uh, about recently. Immunotherapy has been shown uh, to work uh, together with chemo to make chemo work better and improve survival and improve uh, response rate um, as well. 
Now, even if someone has, you know, we've been talking about the stages of cancer, even if someone has stage four, there's still reasons to be hopeful, right? Absolutely. I told patients all the time, you know, just because, uh, you know, they're diagnosed with stage four cancer, it doesn't mean that that's it in the end. I'm going to die within a few months. So, so far from it, because stage four is highly treatable. We have many, many good options, not just options, but good options that help patients live um, a longer and, and uh, live a productive life, really. So good quality of life. So for, for example, you know, when we talk about breast cancer, the, the, the type that people are concerned most about or scared most about is triple negative. You know, the ERPR2 all negative. That's considered a more aggressive disease. Uh, but, you know, I had patients who um, had triple negative stage four and uh, I gave them combination of immunotherapy and chemotherapy together and they have been doing well still on treatment with, with very minimal side effects for more than three years and still ongoing. Uh, and, and they're healthy and, and they go about their daily uh, activity. And, and so that's a very exciting thing. Right? That is, that yeah. is amazing. Thank you for yeah. sharing that story. Sure. Yeah. So now we want to open this up to our panel discussion. And we want to remind you that if you have a question, you can use the chat feature on your screen. And we're going to try to get to as many of your questions as possible. And let's start with some of the questions that are already coming in. Um, what lifestyle changes can I make to lessen my risk? Who would like to take that one? So, yeah, I, I can go with that. So, so in order to know what to do, you need to know the risk factors, right? Because whatever we do, then, then we just reduce the risk factors. So some of the risk factors are obesity, overweight, um, uh, and, and that's something that we tell patients all the time is that physical activity is important. You need to exercise, go out there and, and try to maintain an ideal good body weight, drink less alcohol because alcohol is a risk factor uh, for, for breast cancer and hormonal uh, replacement therapy because some, some patients who are postmenopausal who have symptoms of menopause, like hot flash and stuff. So therefore, they, they take estrogen or estrogen progesterone to reduce the symptom, but those are risk factor as well. So if they take that, they need to talk with the doctors about uh, doing something to reduce the, the risk of uh, breast cancer from uh, from hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Thank you for that, doctor. Um, another audience member would like to know, should I think about genetic testing? Do you want to take that one, Loving? Yeah, I can take that one, sir. Sure. So um, genetic testing, uh, the purpose of genetic testing is to look for what are called mutations. So variations in people's genes or their DNA that may predispose them or, or make them at, at a higher chance of getting breast cancer over the course of their life. Um, and there certainly are many known genetic mutations that are inherited from family member, family member to family member, where in a family line, that family has a higher risk of breast cancer as a result of that. And so uh, my recommendation for any patient is to um, have a thorough discussion with your, your doctor, with your primary care physician, um, and talk about your family history, your personal history, any health problems that you have had, and as a result of that assessment, um, you'll have what's called a cancer risk score. Um, and so um, that will determine what your lifetime risk, or their overall risk of getting breast cancer is based on all of that history taking. Um, and for a certain proportion of that population, based on those answers and based on their risk factors, they may qualify for genetic testing. And what I recommend as well is that genetic testing is done in an environment where you have follow-up. Um, so for example, at Banner MD Anderson, we have uh, genetic counselors. We have a high risk program that assesses people specifically in this category um, because it's important to have a plan if one of these genetic mutations are identified. Um, the last thing we want is someone to not quite understand what the meaning of a genetic mutation is and, and then to not have a game plan for how to approach it and how to mitigate or, or decrease their risk as a result of that mutation. Do you want to piggyback off of that and answer this next question then? Sure. Because somebody just asked, um, how does care at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center differ from other programs? And you touched on it a little with that genetic testing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a comprehensive cancer program. And specifically talking about breast cancer, we have a comprehensive breast cancer program. What that means is that we have uh, expertise across the entire spectrum of any stage of, of breast cancer. So starting from the beginning, risk assessment, so before anyone even has a breast cancer diagnosis, they have, of course, genetic uh, conditions or risk factors in their family that may predispose them to getting breast cancer. So we have experts that can address that and decrease the risk of even getting cancer in the first place. And that's at the beginning of the breast cancer continuum, all the way to the end, where we have um, surgeons and oncologists like Dr. Kong and Dr. Goyal that will, will treat and, and eliminate the cancer if it's curable. 
Um, and then after the, the treatment is performed, we have reconstructive surgeons who are fantastic at what they do in terms of um, you know, cosmetic procedures uh, for people who choose to do that, um, who can um, address any concerns that patients may have for the after treatment effect. Um, and then going a step further beyond that, we have um, support groups and we have programs such as um, prosthetics and uh, wigs, um, um, so aspects of care like that that can address, um, I suppose, the, the after effect of treatment. Um, and so um, that comprehensive program is important to distinguish because it, in a way, I think of it as synergistic. They feed off each other. Um, so when I'm in practice as a radiologist, if I know what Dr. Goyal is looking for for her treatment of her mm -hmm. breast cancer patients, or I know what Dr. Kong is looking for, I can adjust how I perform my practice mm -hmm. to fit their, their treatment plans, yeah. and vice versa. It goes back and forth. So I, I think that that synergistic of effect makes the, the sum greater than the whole, than, yeah. than the parts. Yeah, thank you for that. So let, let me add to that is that, you know, um, we, we have resources that are unique to the Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center. So we, we have a, a, a clinic, it's called Inflammatory Breast Cancer Clinic, that are unique here. I don't think anybody has, here has it. It's a very rare type of breast cancer, but the most aggressive type of mm -hmm. breast cancer. So therefore, important for patients to be seen in the clinic, specialized in that. So they have all the experts, you know, that they treat the breast cancer and we can do it in a promptly timely manner. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Thank you for adding that. Um, someone asked, will treatment for my cancer affect my ability to have children? Uh, Dr. Royal? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, generally, I'm a radiation oncologist. We would treat the breast, lymph nodes, so chest region could be away from the pelvis area where the ovaries, uterus are. So we shouldn't affect your fertility rate or anything like that. I'm going to have to leave it to Dr. Kong about his systemic therapy. Yeah, yeah. So, so treatment for breast cancer certainly can affect fertility of, of, of women who are young and, and uh, is childbearing um, so, uh, of age. Uh, so chemotherapy certainly can, can uh, damage the ovaries. So therefore, there's a certain thing we could do to mitigate that. So you, usually we talk with patients, their desire to have children or mm -hmm. to have more children or not. Mm -hmm. Because some women say they don't want any children, so that's fine. Some women, they say, yes, I want more children. I, I want to have children at some point, then we usually refer them to fertility clinic for egg harvesting. So that's oh. something they can do. Another way to do is that if they cannot do that for whatever reason, uh, then we can give them an injection once a month uh, to shut down the ovaries so that by doing that, we protect the ovary from chemotherapy. Wow, that's a really, really amazing that those options are available. All right, we've got some more questions coming in. Um, how do mammograms differ with breast implants? Would you like to take that one, Dr. Loving? Yes, yeah, so um, it's a great question. Uh, there are certain parts of, the, of the, the country where that's more relevant than others here in Arizona. That's something that we see frequently. Um, so our technologists, who are the, the folks who are especially trained to actually perform the mammogram, mm -hmm. they are fantastic they're experts and this is what they are trained for um, and so um, when we perform a mammogram in someone with implants we're able to um, essentially isolate the breast tissue as best as we can from the implant and how we do that is by we call them displaced views and that means that you um, literally you, you move the implant back and you move the breast tissue forward and take a picture of that component of the tissue it, it sounds it uncomfortable sounds painful. it yeah. does um, but what I can say again our Technologists are great. I will give a shout out to them. They are great at what they do. So they're able to make this, um, this as comfortable as possible for people. So it's not as bad as you might psychologically think it might be. Um, what about screening recommendations for women with dense breasts? Is there a difference if someone has dense breasts? Do they need to be following different guidelines? I can, yeah. I can answer that. Okay. So yeah, so the, the challenge with dense breasts, dense breast refers to um, so, uh, taking a, a step back, so the breast in general is composed of fat and it's composed of what we call fibroglandular tissue, which is basically everything else other than fat. Um, and dense breasts refer to having relatively more fibroglandular tissue and relatively less fat um, in the breast. And it's in some cases genetic and inherited, so we see people that follow their mothers and aunts that mm -hmm. have dense breasts, they also have dense breasts. Um, and it's a spectrum of normal. But the challenge with it on mammograms is that dense breast tissue, which is again normal, it appears white on a mammogram. When we look for breast cancer, it also looks white. And so in someone with very dense breast tissue, you could think of it, the analogy I like to use is a, a polar bear in a snowstorm. It, it, you'll, you'll see a white breast cancer hiding among a background of white dense breast tissue. 
So that's the challenge, and it has been shown to decrease, so it hinders our ability to find breast cancers um, with mammograms. So um, the recommendation for how to address that, it's in an active area of research. Uh, first, for all people, what I do recommend is at least getting what's called a 3D mammogram. Um, a 3D mammogram helps to take a picture through the breast tissue, helps to look through that dense breast tissue, and it, and it, and it increases the odds that we'll see a cancer if it's there. The second thing to think about, again, circling back to what we talked about, is the risk level. For people that are at high risk or have a genetic mutation, um, they certainly qualify for what we call supplemental screening. Um, so in addition to yearly mammograms, what we'll recommend is um, a more powerful test like an MRI or a newer test, which is called something called a contrast mammogram. These tests are basically more advanced tests that can see through that dense breast tissue and help us to see these breast cancers that may be hiding. Um, and then in between, there's a subset of the population that are not quite very high risk, but they're also not low risk or average risk. They're in the in-between zone, where they have a few risk factors, but not all the ones that put, put them into the high risk group. That category, that intermediate category, is an active area of research. Uh, what I do encourage people to do is talk to their doctor about it. There are options, for example, a breast ultrasound, um, possibly an MRI for certain people. Um, that can supplement mammograms and help to see through that dense breast tissue. Okay, and one of the questions that just came in is um, when someone is high risk, an MRI and mammogram are ordered, which is more specific and which is more sensitive? Why both? Would you like to add some more to sure, that topic? Yeah, so um, first what I'll say is that mammograms, the reason why mammograms are so strongly recommended is because of, of all the tests that we have to look for breast cancer, any test to look for breast cancer, uh, mammograms are the only one that have been proven through robust, rigorous research that have been proven to decrease death from breast cancer. Um, so that's the reason why we always recommend getting mammograms, no matter what. Yearly mammograms for anyone, high risk, average risk, intermediate risk, mammograms every year. Um, for the high risk group, the reason why we recommend getting MRI is because, um, uh, once a year MRI in addition to the yearly mammograms, is because MRIs have been proven superior in some populations to find more breast cancers that the mammograms did not find. Um, now there's a trade-off there like anything. The reason why we don't uniformly say, well, in that case, everyone should get an MRI is because um, it, it does, like we talked about the false alarms, MRI has the potential to find more false alarms. It has the potential to find more things that end up needing biopsy or end up needing further testing that are not significant. Um, and so for the average population, those extra tests, the extra costs, the extra inconvenience associated with that is probably not worth it. But for the high risk groups, uh, family history, genetic mutation, categories like that, it's probably worth it because your chance of getting breast cancer is higher and therefore the trade-off is likely worth it. And that's why we recommend supplementing yearly mammograms. But again, we do uniformly recommend yearly mammograms for everybody because of that robust evidence that these other tests don't quite have yet. These have not been around long enough. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, when it comes to treatment, uh, Dr. Hong, I'll have you take this one. Are there any long-term complications? So yes, there are long-term complications, but rare. Most patients actually have short-term complications that usually resolve uh, a few months after completion of chemotherapy. But there are certainly long-term complications. Some examples, lymphedema, right? After surgery, some patients may develop lymphedema anytime. Um, you know, it can be many years after surgery or uh, hair loss in a rare patient can be permanent or, or long-term. Uh, or neuropathy, a certain chemo can cause tingling numbness sensation, neuropathy in the fingers or, or the toes that can last long-term uh, or permanent in, in some patients. Uh, so uh, some people have fogginess, conco chemo brain that can last for a long time. Uh, so, so those are some of the, the rare complications can last for a long time. To go on that, um, for radiation, there are some long-term side effects just to be aware of. Um, radiation can cause scar tissue formation, so the breast can look, feel firmer or look smaller. So um, just, you know, as an awareness towards all the treatments that they're going to get. Okay, great information. Um, we have this question, and forgive me, I may butcher the name of this drug here. Um, why five to ten years on anastrozole. Anis <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Um, for stage one breast cancer, why would that treatment be five to ten years is what they would like to know. So everything we do is based on previous studies. You know, we, we don't make up any of these numbers. So arbitrarily in the past, you know, they do five years. 
of uh, any endocrine therapy, anastrozole or tamoxifen or, or any kind of hormone blockers. And later on, you know, they, they try to do 10 years to see whether 10 years is better than, than five years or not. For most sta stage one, I think five years is adequate, but certain patients, you know, we may go beyond five years. It depends on the stage of the cancer, if the lymph nodes involvement or the aggressive of the, of the cancer. Uh, so therefore, that's a five to 10 year come from, just based on previous studies. Okay. And these are quite arbitrary number, which is five years and then 10 years. Okay, and then another question, are there alternatives to mammogram compression screenings? It's all compression, right? Yeah, you know, so compression, you know, I, like we talked about, that's the, one of the concerns with mammograms because it's uncomfortable. You right, know, right. There's no way to get around that. It's uncomfortable to have your breast squeezed between two plates. Um, with the newer machines to address that, with the newer machines that we have, the uh, imaging technology has improved such that the amount of compression, the, the the, the, the pressure that's being squeezed in the breast has decreased over time, so less compression is required. Um, some of the new machines also have contoured compression plates, and so instead of a flat plate, it's sort of curved mm. to, to conform to the shape of the breast, and so that also can add to the level of comfort. Um, but uh, in the end, they all require some degree of compression. So um, in terms of alternatives, um, so um, as I mentioned, uh, Mammograms are the only tests that have been proven to reduce breast mm -hmm. cancer mortality. All the other tests have had small studies um, to show that, yes, they possibly work, but nothing has been proven as, um, as definitively as mammograms, which is why there's no way to um, avoid uh, having that compression with the mammogram and still get the same degree of confidence that you're achieving that, um, that risk reduction from, from early detection. Um, now, there are some alternatives people may hear of. One, for example, is a thermogram. Um, a thermogram, which you may hear about in um, the community, it's an it's a infrared camera. It's a camera that looks for, for heat. Um, so you could think of it as a camera when I'm taking your picture. I'm seeing which part of your body is temperature-wise hotter than the other parts of the body. The thought behind that is breast cancer needs, or any cancer, needs a high degree of blood flow to it to supply the cancer cells to grow. Um, and as a result of that, they're, they're hotter and uh, the thermogram in theory can show hotter parts of the breast and therefore that may be a cancer. Um, un unfortunately, the evidence supporting it is just not there. Um, it has not achieved the, the early, det early detection uh, capability that, that we would like and so for that reason it's not recommended. Um, another um, non-compression technique may be ultrasound exams. So breast ultrasounds are a tool that we use frequently to look for abnormalities in the breast and they have the advantage of looking through dense breast tissue. Um, the, the downside of mammograms in terms of replacing, mam uh, the downside of ultrasound in terms of replacing mammograms is, um, again, going back to that evidence, like Dr. Kong talked about, everything that we recommend in medicine in general is um, evidence-based, and that just means that there has to be strong evidence um, to show that it actually works yeah. before any of us would recommend that you mm -hmm. have it. Uh, uh, ultrasounds, in terms of a screening exam, haven't, haven't achieved that level of evidence. Um, they, it has not been shown at this point to reduce breast cancer mortality. And for that reason, along with the other tests, we can't recommend it as, hey, this is a valid replacement for mammograms, but it can be potentially a supplement, an, an, addi an additional test on top of mammograms. We have another question about uh, treatment. Outside of mastectomy, what are other surgical options. Dr. Hong, do, would you like to take that one? Yeah, so, you know, mas mastectomy to remove the whole, whole breast, was, that's what it means. But it depends on the size of the tumor or the desire of the patient as well. If the tumor is small enough, we can do a lumpectomy, just remove the lump on only. We spare the whole breast, so it's called breast conserving surgery. Uh, so that's something that the, the uh, physician and, and I mean the, the uh, patient and the surgeon need to discuss to talk about what to do. So one thing is that yes, a small tumor, we can, can do the lump, but some patients have great anxiety about cancer recurrence. They want the breast to be removed and that's, we can do mastectomy based on that alone because mental health is important. Some patients have great anxiety yeah. throughout their life, that's not, not a good thing either, so. Yeah. And one thing I could piggyback on that is our hypofractionated therapy for breast cancers. Yeah, yeah, so as far as radiation goes, you know, based on the type of surgery a patient would have would, you know, help us to determine how many treatments for radiation, what location we would be treating breast plus lymph nodes or breast alone, chest wall. So it is helpful to have that discussion with a surgeon and know up front what surgery they're gonna have. But at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center, I think we offer more of the short course of radiation therapy now, right, as opposed to the standard so six weeks. 
Yeah, yeah, and it all depends on a patient's risk factors and what the pathology shows. But the short course of radiation, um, we are now offering you know five days of treatment potentially um, if a patient is a candidate for it versus um, 15 to 20 days, which mm. is standard of care. So we are starting to get more and more data on different fractionations that we may be able to offer some of our patients. We had uh, another question. Um, this is an interesting one. If a patient is at high risk for breast cancer, would that also mean she is at higher risk for other female cancers? Let, let me, yeah, take okay. that one first. So, uh, so that is true mainly for, say, a genetic mutation. If a patient has a genetic mutation, uh, that confer uh, uh, high risk for breast cancer, but it can confer high risk for ovarian cancer as well. One of the most common example is uh, BRCA mutation, BRCA mutation one or two. So if a patient have a, a BRCA one or two mutation, then just high risk for both breast and ovarian cancer. So that that's a side. Other risk factor for breast cancer and for female cancers like ovarian and uterine cancer are uh, very common. So. Uh, all the common risk factors are obesity, uh, you know, uh, overweight, um, use of hormone replacement therapy, uh, early Medicaid, meaning that you have menstruation at an early age or late menopause, you, you stop menstruation at a late age, uh, or if you never had, uh, uh, never became pregnant before, never had children before. So all of those are risk factors for breast and ovarian and uterine cancer, similar to that. Another question that we got was, if I have a male in my family who had breast cancer, does that increase my risk as a female family member? So it's very similar to what I said before about um, uh, mutation, genetic mutation, because a, a man with breast cancer tend to have a high um, um, prevalence of having a genetic mutation as opposed to a woman with breast cancer. So therefore, with a male with breast cancer, regardless of any, any uh, age or any type of breast cancer, we always do genetic testing. And uh, so therefore, with a family member, you know, with a genetic testing, then uh, uh, anybody else in the, um, uh, the, the family need to be tested. And if they're positive for that mutation, then yes, they're high risk for, for cancer. And the second thing is that with male or female uh, uh, breast cancer in the family, you know, it's a risk factor for, for a, a person to, to have high risk of breast cancer if there's a family members. The, the higher the number of family members with breast cancer, the higher the risk, uh, whether it's male or female. We also got a question about at-home genetic testing. What are your thoughts on that? I can, I can answer that. Okay. So um, at-home genetic testing, so uh, everyone may have heard about these um, commercial companies that test mm -hmm. for like your ancestry. And some, oftentimes, some of these companies will also offer um, genetic testing for medical conditions. It's like an add-on. That's right. Yeah. Um, and um, I would uh, caution people to use that as an official, quote unquote, official test for genetic conditions uh, for a number of reasons. One, um, when we look for genetic mutations, it's oftentimes done in a panel. Um, and what that means is that when someone submits their DNA sample to a genetic testing, a, a medical genetic testing company that, that one of our patients do, for example, they oftentimes screen for a number of common genetic mutations that can result in um, pathology or um, harm to them in the future, like, for example, a BRCA mutation or another mutation that predisposes them for cancer. The, a lot of the commercial companies don't do a, a comprehensive panel, so they may test for one or two or, or very specific genetic mutations but it's missing a large portion of that genetic panel that we normally test for with our patients. Um, and so that can provide false reassurance for someone that believes they're, they're free of genetic mutation mm -hmm. when it, in fact, they didn't receive a full test. Um, the other uh, caution that I would have for using that to replace a, an official genetic test um, is it, it lacks the genetic counseling aspect of it. Um, it's important to understand when someone is diagnosed with a genetic mutation that has long-term implications for their health um, because they need to have genetic uh, risk reduction that comes with that. Um, there, are, are, there, are, there are things you can do to reduce your risk. And if someone doesn't have that backup with a genetic counselor, for example, to talk to them about the significance of these mutations, um, it, it can cause a lot of anxiety to know what to do next. Um, and that also has implications for your family members because um, if someone has children, siblings, mm -hmm. parents that may also have these mutations, they also may need to be tested. Um, and they would also therefore need to have that genetic uh, the consultation with an uh, expert to talk to them about the implications and treatment options for that. 
Another question we just got is, I had a double mastectomy with reconstructive surgery. Should I be getting my implants checked? What would you all say to that? I can, I can talk about that. Um, so there are different types of implants that are used, of course, for reconstruction. Um, and um, I would encourage everyone to talk to their reconstructive or their plastic surgeon about um, how to assess in general the manufacturers will often re have a recommendation for how often the implant should be evaluated because over a certain number of years, um, like anything, implants will deteriorate, they'll break down. Um, so it's not uncommon, for example, for me, if I'm looking at a mammogram or an ultrasound of someone who's had breast implants for 10, 15, 20 years, oftentimes these older implants will have broken down, they'll have ruptured, um, essentially they'll, they'll mm -hmm. deteriorate in terms of their, their consistency. Um, and at that point, depending on the person's priorities, um, a ruptured implant is not necessarily a, a, a health concern in the sense that it will make you ill, um, but cosmetically it's not the same outcome that people would have initially had when they first had the, had the implant placed. Um, and so um, if there's concerns at that point, they may want to get checked. Um, but I would encourage people to talk to their plastic surgeon about should they have it regularly checked. That okay. The guidelines for that vary. Um, and depending on the implant that's, that's placed by the surgeon, they would be able to consult and um, address how often it should be checked, if, if at all. Okay. Um, we have another question coming in right now. Is it considered a new cancer when a tumor is found in a new quadrant of the breast from the prior tumor, or is that considered a cancer that has spread? So. Uh, so usually we, we don't consider a cancer has spread to a different quarter and so usually we consider a new cancer even okay. though uh, people tend to use the term recurrence very commonly for a new cancer that developed in a patient who already had cancer before but usually that's considered a new cancer if the new cancer away from the previous cancer. Okay, straightforward. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, Let's, let's try to give uh, some hope here because I know that all of you guys are very good at doing that. Uh, what does life look like after being treated for cancer? I, I'd actually like all of your takes on this. Okay, so you wanna go first? Yeah, I mean, the goal is that the patient would get through their treatments and have it behind them, you know, move on and live their life. Knowing that this happened, they'd obviously have to continue to see an oncologist for at least five years for follow-up, but um, hopefully that's just a little part of their life and yeah. they get to live the rest of their life as normal. Thank you for that. Dr. Loving? Yeah, so um, it, of course, and different people have different reactions to cancer as, mm -hmm. as expected. I think it's all a spectrum of normal. There's no mm -hmm. normal way to respond or, or normal way to live with a cancer diagnosis or to be a cancer survivor. Cancer, of course, is one of those things that once you have that diagnosis and hopefully you're, you're cured and treated, um, it will live with you forever. Um, so um, I see patients, because people will still come back for the yearly mammograms, of course, after they had a breast cancer diagnosis. Um, so I'll still see them for many, many years. Um, and every time they come in, there's, there's always that uh, question in the back of their mind, is this gonna be the year again yeah. when I'm diagnosed? And, and that will, again, it'll, it'll never go away. Um, but it is important to know that uh, we, we do see some patients where, yes, it does come back. Can we do see cancer again, and we've seen many of those patients where we treat them successfully again. Um, and so um, it's, it is important to stay on top of those surveillance imaging after a cancer diagnosis because, of course, if it comes back, we want to find it. Um, what I can say is that we do have, at Banner MD Anderson, um, we do have uh, support groups. Um, and um, they're open to anyone with a cancer diagnosis and at any stage of the cancer diagnosis, not necessarily a, new, a newly diagnosed cancer. It could be someone who has been a survivor for 20 years. Yeah. Um, but if it's helpful for that person to have a group of people who have been through things like them, who have mm -hmm. experienced life like them of cancer, um, we do have um, support options because um, oftentimes it's just helpful to have a community to talk yeah. to about things. Dr. Kong? So I, I actually want to tell patients that uh, most patients with cancer, uh, breast cancer, are cured of their disease, really. So yes, cancer can come back in some patients, but, but uh, it depends on the stages, but overall it's the minority. The majority of patients are cured. 
And so therefore, I want patients to go out and do whatever they normally do, live their life. And, and anxiety is always there. Anxiety in the back of their mind, they're always concerned about cancer of recurrence, of course. Uh, but I, I try to talk to them not to focus on that on a daily basis, right? Just move forward and, and, and go back to the work and, and raise children and, you know, go out and, and uh, have fun, you know. So, so live a normal life if you can and don't focus too much on, on the word cancer because it causes a lot of uh, anxiety and, and uh, depression for, for no reason. Yeah. Because most of them are actually cured of the cancer. Well, Dr. Yeah. Kong, Dr. Loving, Dr. Goyle, we have really appreciated your time, all of your wonderful information. Thank you so much for being here for this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. And we're really grateful